Pro athletes. Um, somebody's going to have to be rethinking what pro, co pro contracts are worth. Nobody's watching TV. Nobody's watching them catch a ball. Nobody's watching them throw a ball. Um, you know, what, what are pro athletes worth compared to bus drivers and garbage people that grab the garbage trucks? Could it change the landscape of the luxury markets? Oh, I mean, seriously. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's good that people want to help each other and do things. But the reality is, it, in times of crisis, people have to learn to depend on themselves and their family. And so what we're learning very quickly is that so many people are so dependent on somebody else to help them. So I think a real direct, I go back to the, the mentality of the depression. People will learn to, to depend on themselves. Uh, I mean, I, I, I see a, a great, a, a real movement of people who say that the government cannot, did not help me when I needed help. I'm going to have to learn how to take care of myself. So all of this is, it all gets back to shelter. Where are people going to live and how are they going to live? But yeah. As you're as you're thinking through, you've you've accumulated assets. You've done unbelievably well. So, as you're looking to your your friend that was in the medical, that's in medical supplies, what does he want? What does he think the outcome is going to be? Does he think six months from now everything's going to be back to normal? Um, we didn't we didn't get to that part of the conversation. I, I wish I could say. <laughs> So I'm, I'm saying we're a year out. We got a tepid recovery coming this summer. Well, uh, there, I think there'll be a second wave of, of the virus coming through for sure in the fall, which it we won't have a shutdown like we're having right now. People will be better prepared. There'll be times to get more masks. There'll be times to get more things done. But so many businesses are going to fail. The whole, everything about zoning is going to have to change. Why is it fair for me or you to be able to work from home, but the auto mechanic not be able to work from home? I mean, I mean that, that doesn't seem fair. I can have people car, cars dropped off at his driveway and he can work and make a living. Yeah, there's a practicality in the tools though, right? Well, um, I think it all gets back to neighborhood restrictions. You don't want people working in their driveway because it's not attractive. Uh, well, there's not a lift in most mechanics driveways. Uh, so, you know, you can, uh, <laughs> so there's the issue right there. You uh, roll them up, put them up on uh, stands, uh, jack them up, do the work. So the, the whole thing about what's going to be permitted in neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. All kinds of zoning issues are going to have to change. Uh, that everybody talks about mixed use properties, mixed use buildings. Well, the first floor of a mixed use building is some kind of commercial structure, a, a restaurant, a dry cleaner, right? Everybody that's doing mixed use properties today are going to have to completely rethink what those mixed use spaces are worth. Uh, who's going to be the tenant? Uh, who's going to be an acceptable credit risk? And what are the end buyers left with all those pension funds that went that acquired those things? It, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, so you got to go into a lobby and into a six by six elevator. I assure you, there are a lot of people who don't want to get into a six by six elevator for a long time in the future. <laughs> yes. Can you imagine? I mean, I'm, I've said this many times. I'm not a germaphobe uh, under any criteria and uh, neither is my son. Uh, my younger son might be a little bit, not much, but not Garrett. So, but we're really being careful about what we do going back to the fear factor, right? We don't want to do something that would endanger his children, my, my wife, his wife, our family, right? We're not so much concerned about ourselves. I think we're immortal kind of thing, but, uh, but that whole mindset of fear makes sure that we don't do those. And the people who are germaphobes, I can't imagine going into a little bitty elevator and you got to punch a button. Mm. 
<laughs> I don't, I don't see that. Punched, yeah. Uh. Everybody's got dinosaur hands. You know, they don't want to touch anything. I don't get their elbow. <laughs> <laughs> Elbows, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so how much? How much are you traveling now? Zero. I'm not even coming out locally. It's uh, our the company has an initiative for not one employee to contract the COVID virus um, as a result of work functions. So we're operating 100% from home. So that sounds real good, right? But the reality is that it's all about their insurance premiums. If they can. <laughs> It's all about insurance. They'll be able to lessen their insurance premiums if they can make sure nobody gets uh, COVID-19. Oh, and I guarantee you. I think insurance is moving that fast? Oh, yeah. The, 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 in, the lawsuits that are about to start coming uh, because of COVID yeah. are going to reshape the, the, the aging population of this country way more than COVID has because it's going to eliminate the nursing home industry. You think? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean... Well, first off, the, the nursing homes are, are all based on one model of, I mean, not one model, but each, each nursing home has a budget in whatever state it's in to meet re government regulations, local regulations, federal regulations for requirements for staff. They can't make staff show up, right? Yeah. But, but you wind up with these nursing homes are all getting blamed for the deaths of uh, yeah. the family members that are in the homes mm -hmm. and it, and the news makes it really, it's really sad that the family members can't be with their family member when they pass. Yep. And that is sad. I mean, I, I, I do understand that, but you can just see the attorneys lining up to sue uh, for emotional damage and COVID is not going to be covered under force majeure clauses uh, of, or continuing operation clauses of the, uh, business and so they're not going to have any insurance coverage. The insurance yeah, companies expand on that. You know why would it not be covered under force majeure? Because the uh, I was in a conversation uh, on the 11th of March, okay. making the observation then that uh, the insurance companies were going to be the biggest losers. In the conversation, the person I'm speaking with, who is an insurance broker received uh, a, a, an email from the insurance service organization stating that they were uh, that COVID-19, COVID-19, the coronavirus was not going to be covered under a business interruption or a force majeure policy because it was uh, an unusual act of nature. It wasn't a fire, it wasn't a hurricane, it wasn't war, and it certainly wasn't a terrorist act. And it's so not going to be covered. And so all of these attorneys, all of these companies are trying to sue uh, their insurance policies. Um, and it's, they're not going to get paid. It's going to be litigated out for years. In the meantime, the businesses are all going to go broke. So the nursing homes, their business model says that they're going to be 88% occupied, 90% occupied with the normal turnover and the normal expenses. Now going forward, who's going to move their family over the next year, 18 months, who's going to move their family member into a nursing home and what nursing home can say that they can, you can move somebody in and they've met all these procedures to keep them safe in the future. Cause they don't know that they've done that. Right. They, they, they can meet all the procedures that they're, that are obligated for today, mm -hmm. but they have no way of knowing what's going to happen in the future just like they had no way of foreseeing the COVID problem, but they're still going to get sued and they still got to defend themselves. So at some point, and it's not much of a point, people quit building those buildings because you can't figure out what your rate of return is going to be. So um, I, the, in my video I did on the losers, one of the losers that I pointed out were farms, farmland. And there's been all kinds of investors who've been buying all kinds of farmland. Yeah. But we can see clearly nobody knows what farmland is worth anymore because nobody knows exactly how much of a crop you'll ever be able to sell. And nursing homes, 
they've got space that has to be occupied. If you can't figure out what it costs to occupy that space by the person that's going to be st staying there, living there, there's no way to put a business model together to value a nursing home. So there are ever how many hundreds of thousands, millions of people in nursing homes today. How does the nursing home continue to stay open with a declining population of people to take care of the people that are there now? It's a certainty a nursing home cannot survive with 60% occupancy. They lose money every day. They, they, they have to close. Where do those people go? And I'm going to tell you, in the next 90 days, this is, there's two big waves coming. That one right there, which is where are these people going to begin to move to? Because you're going to see nursing homes by the end of July, 1st of August, you're going to see nursing homes close or need some kind of massive help everywhere in the United States. And the farms that are going to go broke by the end of August, 1st of September, will be staggering. So, and the problem is nobody will be able to value what the farmland is worth going forward. And nobody will be able to value what the nursing home buildings are worth because you'll never, you, it's going to be really hard to come up with an occupancy number. My wife says I sound really dark. <laughs> I think with you on the nursing home thing, I, I mean, I, I don't understand the crop thing. So uh, the crop thing, is right now um, the restaurant industry, the cruise industry um, are about 40 to 50 percent of all of the usage I of cro crops, right? Sure. So I, I, I would agree that I think that the supply chain is going to be reinvented, right? So the, the consumption still needs to happen. So um, we're, we're proving right now that you can live without restaurants. So how long can an average family farm survive? You miss a crop or a crop rotation. You're, you bury the crop that you've got now because you can't afford to harvest it. You've already lost money. So you're, you're having to till the crop you've got under or you're letting it rot in the field, one of the two. Sure, but the lunch that you and I would have uh, for our lunch appointment uh, that we're not having because the restaurant is closed, you're now eating at your home and I'm eating at my home. So the food is still being consumed, just through, albeit through a different channel, yes? So, so no. So the, the problem is that the food that comes into grocery stores is a packaged product. It's a sized product. The, the food that goes into grocery stores is a bulk product. It's a completely different packaging, completely different process, and completely different level of consumption. It really winds up that the, um, um, the way in which we begin to look at the products is and the food consumption is there's it's unlikely that they'll be able to get the food um whoa did i just turn you off i did something all is good on my side and it's me there you are uh then so that the issue gets to be that uh the amount of food in its, its term, right? They've got to get a crop in the ground. They've got to harvest, grow the crop, harvest the crop, sell the crop. If you miss one entire growing season, like all these crops that are being turned over right now, they've already got all the money spent. They've got no money coming in. Sure. So they've got to find the money somewhere to put another crop in the ground. But nobody knows what the consumption is going to be because you can't say how many restaurants are going to open back up. So if you don't know what your ability to plant a crop is because you have no idea what the, the sale consumption is, the, the ground has no value. So all real estate is only worth what it'll grow. All real estate value is based on that very simple metric. It's only worth what it'll grow. So farmland grows crops. Subdivision land grows houses. Industrial land grows factories. Commercial lands grows Starbucks, right? So it's only worth the revenue that it'll generate. So if you don't know what it's worth, you don't know how to peg a number for it, 
it's really hard to determine what that land is worth. We know it has value, right? We know it has value. Yep. But we don't know what that value is. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I I'm still I'm 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 not sure that I'm fully across the the notion of that. So what what that farmland is going to have to do is it's going to have to reinvent how it how it generates its revenue so it may not be selling to the kfc it may be it's going to have to have a different outlet so where you would have spent your ten dollars and your chicken tenders at holiday inn you're now spending it in five or eight dollars at kroger because you've eaten that meal at home so kroger's demand increased holiday inn's food demand decreased right so it's but it's a net zero gain is it not on the no. food it, 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 it's and the reason it didn't it's there's so many more restaurants that so many more people are eating in than ever eat at home and so we wind up with a situation that because of cruise ships because of hotels restaurants uh not being able to buy food it's it's somewhere around 40 or 50 percent of the food supply that's being grown in this country so let's say that, let's say that housing can pick up residential construction can pick up 10 or 15 percent it's still 30 or 35 percent unknown sales so 30 30 or 35 percent uh, i i personally am not eating 30 or 35 percent less food in a given day no we're not so we we this will get me onto another topic here but the uh but what happens is again because you cannot project the as in a nursing home you cannot project the occupancy that's going to be there or the cost of operation yeah. It becomes really difficult to understand who's going to own a nursing home and what would they pay for the buildings that are there. It's mm -hmm. the, the same thing with a farm because you don't know the level of the product, the, the crop that can be grown and how much of that, that crop can be sold at what price. It becomes very difficult to determine what that land is worth for whatever crop it will grow. Now, there's, there's zero chance that we're going to run out of food in this country, but there is a 100% chance that there could be massive in uh, massive food insecurity in large areas of the country. We, you know, live in an area where we're blessed to have good supermarkets, good availability, good supplies. And we've both been blessed with opportunity that we can buy groceries. But man, when I saw those lines, uh, 12,000 cars lined up in San Antonio, I think it was, to go to a food pantry out there. And what I noticed is those cars were just like the cars I saw in St. Augustine, Florida last year. So last year we're down in St. Augustine for a little family reunion and everything was full, Jason. I mean, it was, it wasn't, it's not Miami beach. It's, it was real middle-class America. There were Chevrolets and Ford pickup trucks and Kias and every kind of uh, family van you could possibly see. I mean, there, it was, the place was just full of families, all ages real middle-class America. Okay. And what I really noticed were all the cars were generally new. They were three or four or five years old or new, brand new. And these, these were people that had, we learned during the great recession, 2008, that people will keep their cars quicker than they will keep their houses. And so these are people that had kept their cars and in the last few years had made a decision to buy a new car. And now, those same people were lined up at a food pantry to get food. Those same kind of cars, that same group of people. And I mean, so you go from having great dreams and aspirations and going on family vacations to being lined up in a food pantry. So that, that idea of food security, that idea that we're going to be able to uh, have in the future, I mean, it doesn't take many times. I, I can't. I can't imagine a situation where you you line up in a food pantry three or four or five times. It doesn't change the way you think about food in the future. What you're going to do, what you're going to buy, where you're going to eat. And I mean, it, these are fun. I you know, I see fundamental changes coming in society. Fundamental changes. Over what time frame? If we have a second wave in. Um, that's that's kind of bad in the fall um, next year. It'll, um, it'll it'll happen this year. 
will have this massive recovery when they get the vaccine. No matter what happens, we have a, a massive recovery when we get the vaccine. It's just that you'll see these divergent lines. You'll see these people that feel themselves responsible now mm-hmm. that won't be able to, that haven't been able to care for themselves and their family, their kids. And those people are just going to reach a level and they're going to plateau out just like your grandfather, just like the people from the depression. They're going to save. <laughs> they're going to always make sure they have a 14 day supply of toilet paper, right? They're going to, they're going to live a different life. And the people that will be able to take risk and be able to get things done will certainly participate in a booming economy because the demand in America is going to be phenomenal. The jobs that are going to be created in this country, because I think you're going to have hundreds of thousands of jobs relocated out of China. I can't see any pharmaceutical company that's participating in creating a vaccine today standing up and saying, oh, yeah, we're going to leave all of our production in China. I just can't see that happening. Yeah. I can't either. So, you know, how many pharmaceutical companies do you need to bring back at 10,000 employees or 5,000, whatever it is, right? When you start talking about making 30 million doses a month of vaccine, um, I mean, or medicine to take, uh, uh, some, some kind of pill that you have to take to keep you protected, like aspirin, <laughs> you know, as ubiquitous as aspirin, and so that it's available everywhere. Those, I just, I can't imagine that those factories are going to stay in China. I mean, if I own stock in one and they said they were going to stay in China, I'd sell my stock. And so I, I see all these factories coming back, in some way. You know, you won't get like, you know, you'll have some factories that the product would be so expensive to be built in America that it would be hard to get it to come back. But I, I think you're going to see a lot of a, a complete change in the landscape on industrialization in this country. And you're going to see lots of pro athletes make a whole lot less money in the future than they've made in the past. I think those are going to be big changes, little changes and big changes. How much of this, uh, how many of these uh, speculative ideas do you think are going to, well, what's your confidence interval here? Are half of these going to come true or you think they're all going to happen? My grandfather used to have a saying, the race may not go to the swift nor the battle to the strong, but that's the way to bet it every single time. And um, I, I, um, I, like I think I'm 100% right on nursing homes. I think I'm a, I'm I'm in the high 90% right on nursing homes. I'm in I'm certainly in the 90 percentile on farmland. I I believe I'm probably the whole issue on manufacturing is going to be what reg environmental regulations will we tear up? That you know that'll be the issue. Yeah. Uh, what kind of zoning laws do we get rid of? And uh, you could see all kinds of new cases go to the Supreme Court on zoning laws. So um, that, that's the only caveat on the, in, if they shred the EPA the way they're shredding the uh, FDA regulations right now, uh, you will see um, an industrialization in this country the way that uh, Henry Ford industrialized it with the auto. Mm. Um, but it's going to take something along the same lines with the EPA that they're doing with the FDA. Sure. Yeah. Have I pontificated long enough? I love it. I can't get enough of this stuff. I'm, I'm an idea junkie. It's fantastic for me. Good food for that. You know, I, 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 people are telling me I ought to be putting out five minute videos and seven minute videos, but I don't have a damn story that's five minutes long. All my stories, <laughs> <laughs> all my stories are too long. <laughs> there's, uh, there's some. Maybe they had a link in their attention span. Uh, so I've. Um, Somebody told me that I should appoint myself the uh, uh, sheriff of the internet and just take on all these other people that are posting these YouTube videos on investing in real estate. Because some of these guys, I mean, honestly, they couldn't give me advice on getting out of an open jail cell. (laughs) 
Victor, I've loved our time. I have one minute. I have to transition. Later. See ya. Later. Take care, man. Thank you.